The Return of the Obra Dinn is the new game from Lucas Pope, the developer of the excellent Papers, Please, who kindly provided me with a free review copy of this game. There are some similarities between Obra Dinn and Papers, Please, such as the main goal being to solve puzzles to determine people's identities, however they both play completely differently. Papers, Please had you solving simple puzzles as quickly as possible. Obra Dinn gives you complicated puzzles but as much time as you need. That means of course that you might be a huge fan of Papers, Please but won't necessarily love Obra Dinn. If anything, Obra Dinn might be compared to older games such as Myst. Regardless of what you compare it to though, The Return of Obra Dinn is phenomenal and I'm giving it 5 stars out of 5. The Return of the Obra Dinn takes place in 1807 aboard the titular merchant ship, the Obra Dinn. The Obra Dinn set sail for Asia in 1803, however it never reached its destination. Four years later, the Obra Dinn mysteriously floats back into ports without anyone on board. Well, no one living anyway. You play the role of an investigator for an insurance company assigned to discover the fates of the 60 people who were on board when it set sail. If for some reason playing as an insurance investigator doesn't float your boat, excuse the pun, then you can just imagine you're playing as a detective which is basically what you are. The only tools at your disposal are a journal that you've been asked to complete by a figure known as HS and a pocket watch ominously embossed with a skull. The journal includes a map, a list of the crew and passengers plus some pictures drawn by the resident artist. Upon finding a dead body, the pocket watch will reverse time and let you see and hear the final moments of that person's life. You need to examine these scenes carefully and deduce the identity of the victim, the cause of death and, if applicable, the killer. Given that this is a puzzle game, I'm going to keep spoilers to an absolute minimum. Bear in mind that I do need to provide a couple of concrete examples in places, however that shouldn't spoil your enjoyment at all. You need to solve the fates of 60 people with various killers and causes of death, so a couple of minor hints here and there aren't a big deal. I'm also restricting video footage to the first hour or so of gameplay, but keep in mind that this first hour isn't entirely representative of the experience. Just watching this video might make the game look largely like a walking simulator or first person narrative experience, however that's not the case. The beginning of the game is front loaded with exploration and murders to watch unfold before the real work begins. I don't want to say much about what happened aboard the ship, so I'll just say that the story is decent enough without being especially memorable. You uncover scenes out of order so the fun part is piecing it all together until you can create a timeline of events. Once I'd done that though, the story didn't hold much interest nor did the ending. There are unknowns and questions to dwell on, but not particularly interesting ones. By the way, you can change the colour scheme from the one I'm using in this video and pick between a few different styles from the 80s such as Macintosh, IBM and Commodore. I thought that was quite cool. The return of the Obra Dinn initially looks like it will be a fairly relaxing experience. You arrive on the ship, watch a couple of murders and make some simple deductions as to who is who. You hear names and titles used, references to family members, etc, so it's not too tricky. The journal is divided up into chapters, so I assumed you would solve each chapter one by one until you had a complete story of events on board the ship. That is not how it plays out. After solving the first mystery, you're left on your own with little in the way of direction other than some visual clues pointing you to the next body. I went from death scene to death scene filling out images in the journal but unable to solve much other than the cause of death which is usually obvious. And then it all stopped. Without realising it I'd watched every available death scene and had all the information required to fill out the entire journal except I had only uncovered three more fates and had over 50 more left to solve. I honestly thought I must have missed a significant mechanic because there seemed to be so little to go on. Then gradually it all started falling into place, especially once I realised I didn't need to nail down every fact with 100% certainty. You're specifically told that you'll need to make inferences and while this initially feels a little odd you get used to it. And all the inferences are logical enough that you never feel like you're being tricked. Just don't expect to find convenient name tags or people saying things like, wow I can't believe John stabbed me, the first mate of the ship, right in the chest. To give you a better idea of the inferences you need to make, these are some of the issues you have to keep in mind while playing. What jobs do people do? If you see someone in the carpenter's room, it is likely either the carpenter or the carpenter's mate. Where are people located in the pictures you're given? The people playing games, drinking and dancing are more likely to be seamen than stewards. What are their nationalities? Due to language barriers, people from one country are quite likely to hang out with companions who are also from that country. What accent do they speak with? What types of clothing are they wearing? The list goes on. You have to keep track of all this stuff via multiple scenes and given the limited monochrome display on offer it can get tough to pick out all the minor details you need to be aware of. Trying to keep track of 60 people would be tough enough in real life let alone with these one bit sketches. I would have loved the ability to make notes within the game perhaps by scribbling on the pictures or with more tagging options. You can bookmark one person at a time to follow their story on board the Obra Dinn but I constantly wanted to do much more such as seeing all the information I had on someone when I hovered over them. If I know someone is Russian but I'm not exactly sure which Russian they are, it would be great to pull that up quickly. You can't even alt tab out of the game for some reason, so making notes on a second screen is tricky. 
If you like to make notes during games like this, I recommend playing in windowed mode with Alt Enter and then taking some screen grabs to annotate separately as you go. The Return of the Oberdin tries to stop you making outlandish guesses by only confirming that you have the correct answer in batches of three complete fates. For the most part this strikes a good balance between giving you feedback and stopping you from brute forcing your way through. But there were definitely a few times where I just wished I knew if I was on the right track in one particular case, especially if there was a slight ambiguity in say the cause of death for example. There were a couple of times where I managed to progress by guessing at the correct identity such as which one was the carpenter and which was his mate, and the exact identity of two brothers. That's not to say that there weren't clues to help me pinpoint which was which, just that I couldn't find them. I'm fairly confident in saying you should never have to make these 50-50 guesses if you're observant enough. For example, there definitely is a way to distinguish between two of the female passengers on board even though it may not initially seem obvious. While I described most inferences as logical, that doesn't mean they don't occasionally feel dodgy for want of a better word. The graphics don't do a great job conveying causes of death like burning for example, and numbers can be tough to pick out. A fair few of the crew members also go missing during scenes but still need to have their fates identified. These crew members are ones that tend to play minor roles and are therefore hard to name. Their cause of death is typically more of an educated guess than most others. This was often an area I fudged my way through and I think it could have been handled better. Again I suspect I missed clues here, but these parts were far less enjoyable to solve than the murders anyway so it felt like filler content. There is one major area of concern which is worth mentioning for non-native English speakers. More than once during my playthrough I used a fairly rudimentary knowledge of accents to help identify people such as the Irish and Scottish crew members. I can't say with absolute certainty that you need to be able to do this to complete the game but I did. There are subtitles for all the audio but as far as I can tell there are no indicators for these accents. I know Americans who are terrible at distinguishing between Irish and Scottish accents so I dread to think how tough this is for the Japanese for example. In addition I needed to know things like Nick is short for Nicholas and Charlie is an alternative for Charles. It's obvious to English speakers but I can imagine a non-English speaking person not knowing that Nick spelled N-I-C-K was short for Nicholas which starts with N-I-C-H. The return of the Oberdin is hard enough as it is so any additional complications could be a problem. It took me 12 hours to complete and as I mentioned there was some guesswork involved at times. If you want to solve each fate with as close to 100% certainty as you can get then it may well take longer. Or not of course. I had a quick look at Steam reviews and it seems that many people are completing Oberdin in around 10 hours so make of that and my intelligence what you will. Personally I found this to be an incredibly challenging game. The way you're just thrust into the experience with little guidance and a lot of information to weed through reminded me of my first time playing Myst although I far preferred this experience. This lack of guidance is in many ways the game's greatest strength. Games such as The Witness have heavy tutorial elements which ease you into new puzzle types until you can tackle the tough ones. However this also means it's hard to go back to after a lengthy break because you've forgotten how the puzzle works. The Return of the Oberdin doesn't have this problem. It's as tough after the first hour as it is after hour 10 and you're using the exact same set of skills the entire way through. I might have binged this game in one day but you don't need to. The journal provides some hints such as suggesting that you focus on identifying some of the easier fates first so at least you have a vague idea where you should be looking. Occasionally the challenge felt a little too tough and I was overwhelmed by all the information, but then I would spot a clue that helped me identify one more person and had a ripple effect when I labelled him in other scenes. Some discoveries can easily lead to you getting three or four people correct in just a couple of minutes. Knowing that you can discover something huge any second makes it hard to tear yourself away. I got sucked into the return of the Oberdin for hours on end, wandering around the ship listening to my footsteps in the storm as I looked for the next piece of the puzzle. Other than the Myst games I can't think of any obvious points of comparison to help you decide whether or not to give the return of the Oberdin a chance. The lack of guidance and completely open nature of all the problems distinguishes it from the likes of The Vanishing of Ethan Carter which had you solving smaller puzzles one at a time. This originality is the exact reason you should try it for yourself. I can't guarantee you'll love it as much as I did but I'm certain it will keep nagging away at you in the back of your mind encouraging you to boot it up one more time to see what else you can discover. Ok I hope you enjoyed this review, I'm going to do a few more of these when I have the time although they won't replace the longer form content. Speaking of which I'm still on course to have the Planescape Torment video up by the end of the month. In the meantime you can follow me on Twitch and Twitter, join the Discord and even become a Patreon to get your name in the credits for just a dollar a month. Cheers.